You can all sit down. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Robert Ferguson, and I have the privilege of speaking on this Good Friday morning, not just to all you wonderful people here, but to every single one of our campuses across Australia and beyond, and also all you wonderful people online. Can I just say, even after speaking for 50 or so years, I'm still always immensely nervous. Because how can we speak of God? How can we declare such an extraordinary message? And how can we speak on this day, perhaps the most momentous day in the entire history of the world? It's impossible, but by the grace of God, in a few minutes, I'm going to share some thoughts about what this day means. And with that in mind, let's just remind ourselves of what we are remembering. Mark chapter 15 and verse 33. At dawn, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled, with a, filled a sponge with wine, vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. I'm going to highlight one verse, and then I'm going to pray. Verse 38. We've just been singing about it. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Father God, thank you very much for these wonderful people who have gathered on this Good Friday morning here at Hills, across Australia and beyond, and online. Thank you for every one of them. I pray that through this short message, you will speak to us and open our eyes to see something of your magnificence and something of the power of the cross that we are remembering today. We ask it in the precious and the most wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. My wife, Amanda, and I love the theater. A few days ago, we celebrated Amanda's birthday by going to one of Shakespeare's plays at the Opera House. In fact, we celebrated our second honeymoon in Stratford-upon-Avon in England, which is Shakespeare's birthplace, so we could watch two more of his plays. One of the magical things about the theater is that the moment when the curtain is drawn back. And you see what is often the most extraordinary set that has been hidden behind it. In a sense, it's like being, for a few minutes, invited into a brand new world. Well, that is the picture of what took place when Jesus died. The massive curtain 
which separated everyone in the temple from the most holy place, the place which symbolized the very presence of God, was torn from top to bottom. Now, when I'm talking about a massive curtain, I'm not talking about the ones in this auditorium that can easily be drawn back or the ones in your living room which you open each day. No, I'm talking about something impregnable, something weighty, something thick, something solid, even though woven. So imagine the moment when Jesus breathed his last and that curtain, that massive, heavy, weighty curtain that symbolized a separation from the very presence of God was torn in two and ripped apart. It must have been, for any Jew in that temple, the most shocking thing that they had ever experienced in their life. It was the greatest revelation of all time. In fact, the word revelation, which in the Greek New Testament is apocalypsis, means the pulling back of a curtain in the theater. But when the temple curtain was drawn back, it wasn't just an invitation into a new world, it was an invitation into a brand new way of living. This message is called a new and living way. Not an old and dead way. Not an invitation into a dead religion or ritualistic observance. It is an opening into a new and living way. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. Of course, there is a massive difference between the curtain in the theater and a curtain in the temple. One of the differences is that in a theater, we are spectators. But in the church of the living God, we are participants. We're not just watching a spectacle. We're not just watching a new set we are invited onto the stage to be vital participants in the play, in the story. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. The word participation there in the Greek is koinonia. It means sharing together in common with. We're not here as spectators. We're not here just to turn up occasionally when it's convenient and sing a few songs. We are here to be participants, have fellowship with God and one another. We're not watching a play we're being invited into the divine play to play our subplot in God's great drama. It's an extraordinary invitation. And there's another difference. When the temple, when the uh, theater curtain is drawn, it's drawn and then drawn back. But when the temple curtain was drawn, it was torn from top to bottom and has never been drawn back. It has given us access for eternity. The theater curtain is drawn back for the next performance, but when God tore the temple curtain, it was drawn back forever and ever and ever. And just as real as it happened on the day 2,000 years ago, that curtain is open for you and I today. 
Let's just have a look at that verse in Hebrews. The writer of the Hebrews, after talking about the powerlessness of our sacrifices and the power of Christ's sacrifice, writes this, Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let's have a look at that curtain for a minute. What does it symbolize? We just read that verse in Mark 15 and we think, well, that's interesting, but it is such a revelatory moment, such a glorious thing that we need to understand something of its relevance to us. A couple of things. Firstly, the curtain separated the unholy from the holy. For us, it, it means so little, but for the Jew, they would know that beyond that curtain was the holy place, the holy of holies, the very presence of God, who the Bible says lives in unapproachable light. He is so glorious, so holy, that no one was allowed to go into that place except the high priest once a year in order to make a covering, an atonement for the people of God. They would have been rightly terrified of what was beyond that curtain. So if standing in that temple that day, suddenly the glory of God, the presence of God, the holy of holies was revealed, it would have terrified the life out of them. They would have thought, we're gonna die. But that's the wonder of this revelation. It wasn't an invitation to death. It was an invitation to life because they had a high priest that was gonna go in once a year, but we have a high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who opened that curtain up to the presence of God forever and for all. It is the most glorious revelation. But if you wanna get it, you've gotta first realize that you are unholy. Because otherwise you think you can just wander in. Second thing, the curtain was opened by God. It says, opened for us in verse 20 of Hebrews 10. And we read in Mark 15 that it was torn from the top to the bottom. If it was a human agency, it would be from the bottom to the top. But God ripped it open for us because God is the one that is taking the initiative. It's not our good works, it's not our church attendance, it's not our Bible reading that gets us close to God. It is God tearing the barrier apart, forgiving our sin through Christ, opening a way where we could approach the unapproachable. The third thing about this passage is that the curtain was torn in two. As I said, it wasn't drawn. It says the curtain represents the body of Christ. He, in effect, was torn in two so that we could access God. We're not only sinners and powerless. We're indebted because of this day. He paid a price that we could not pay and he was torn in two, and that's what we're remembering this day. And then the fourth and final thing that we can make uh, uh, an observation about the curtain, the curtain gave us access. We are invited to enter, but God in his, in his sovereignty has given us free will. He doesn't make us go in, he doesn't force us in. He rips the barrier apart and then invites us to come and join him in the greatest drama that the world has ever known, the greatest story the world has ever heard. You and I, on this Good Friday, are given an invitation 
not just to a, a new set on a stage, but a brand new way of living. What does that look like? Well, here it is in that same text, Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 10. Let me just highlight it for you. Firstly, it's a life of confidence. It says, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. We live in a world of uncertainty. We live in a world that is messy, that is broken, that is hopeless, that is despairing. People are troubled by the wars, they're troubled by the crises, they're troubled by the climate, they're troubled by everything. But this curtain being torn gives us confidence. Confidence has come from the Latin word confidere, to fully trust. God is inviting us into a relationship of trust where we can be confident. I'm always surprised that Christians are losing their stability in an unstable world. The tearing of the curtain shows to me that God has given us access into a new way of living. I am secure, I am certain, I am absolutely trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say a life of confidence. Secondly, a life of communion. A life of communion. It says, let us draw near to God. I said that the word participation means Fellowship, the Greek word koinonia, sharing in common with. Well, that's also the word for communion. It's the same word. We've just celebrated it. Even symbolically, as you took that little cup and tore off the covering with some difficulty and accessed the wafer and the juice, you are participating. We didn't just say watch it as we do it, we invited you to participate. We wanted you to be part of it. Can I just reiterate? Church is not for spectators. Church is for participation. It is for communion. In a world that is increasingly uh, divided, we have a unity. In fact, Jesus said the two things that are gonna set us, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from the world is that we are united and that we love one another. Can I suggest, don't be put off by all the divisions and the increasing polarization in the world. The message of the cross is one of unity. It is one of communion. It's one of participation. What a message. And finally, it's not just a life of confidence and a life of communion. It's a life of cleansing. It says here, our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. In a world of unrighteousness, we can be clean. Not just clean, but free. A couple of years ago, when a friend of mine was uh, going to our Hillsong conference, he invited someone from his office who wasn't a Christian to come to the conference. And as she walked in to the conference, she walked in at the back, saw thousands of people, thousands of people like yourself, she said this, they're all so clean. She had no idea how profound and how prophetic she was. God is inviting us into a new way of living, a life of confidence, a life of certainty, a life of communion, a life of cleansing. It's an invitation that this day puts out to everyone. Whatever campus you're in, wherever you are, watching online or here in this auditorium, it's an invitation. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. There's the word again, participation, communion, sharing together with. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ. His Son purifies us from all sin. It's not just cleansing once, it's cleanses every day. 
If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When Amanda and I went to the theater a couple of days ago, we walked away laughing because it was a funny play, but we walked away unchanged. It was a temporary revelation, a temporary withdrawal of a curtain. Today, we're remembering an eternal drawing back of the curtain. And you can walk away transformed, not just for the Easter weekend, but forever. Maybe we could pray right across this auditorium, bow your heads, and maybe if you're in the other auditoriums, just do the same, just bow your heads, think about where you're at. If you're online, just do the same. If it helps you to focus, close your eyes. Think about your relationship with Jesus Christ. What does Good Friday and what Jesus did on the cross mean to you? I'm going to give you an invitation. I'm inviting you to have fellowship with God and with His body, the church. In order for you to have fellowship, participate in the divine drama, you need to recognize that you've You're a sinner, and that sin has built a wall between you and God. But Jesus has removed the wall. And if you just put your confidence and trust in Jesus today, He will forgive you forever, free your conscience from guilt and sin, and invite you into a brand new way of living. Are you up for that? People are praying. If you're here and you would like Jesus to come into your life, to have communion with him, to have fellowship with him, to be reconciled with him, while people are praying, just do something for me. Quickly, put your hand in the air as a sign that you want Jesus in your life. Fantastic. Hands going up. I'm sure in the other auditoriums and people online, Put your hand in the air. I want Jesus in my life. On this Good Friday, let's all pray this prayer together, but especially if you've just put your hand in the air. Say with me. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, today I remember you and all that you have accomplished for me. Please come into my life. Change me. Do what you said you would do. Forgive me. Thank you for this invitation. I now come to you. I put you in charge. I want to follow you. You are now my king, my lord, my master, my God. Thank you that I am now part of your plan. Amen. Give these people who have responded a huge clap. So good. Can I just say, and uh, you, all you wonderful people in the, the different campuses can go your own way and finish the services, but can I say to all of you here and everyone online, can I just say that if you put your hand up, that's not just a temporary thing. That's the first step of a brand new life. And we would like to help you with that brand new life. So. As we, you leave today, just walk up to someone who's waving one of these Bibles in the fire and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. Can I have one of those Bibles? And we will do everything in our power to help you and support you. Because remember, when you give your life to Jesus, you're having fellowship with him, but also his people. God bless you. God bless you.